Hello, happy Wednesday. Uh, welcome to an adventure. Today on Archival Adventures, we are going to be looking at Godey's Ladies Book, which is a women's magazine from the 19th century. Um, welcome in. I'm, I hope that you're having a good week and um, that you're ready to kind of explore and see what, uh, what a women's magazine looked like a couple hundred years ago. Um, before we get started, I do want to read the uh, Land and Labor Acknowledgement, as is typical for this stream. Uh, so this stream comes out from the Special Collections and University Archives at Virginia Tech, and I am the Community Collections Archivist here, uh, Anthony Wright de Hernandez, and uh, I think it's important that we pay attention to what the school says it's going to do, and actually look to see if it's actually doing it. So. Uh, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tutelo and Monacan people's homeland and we recognize their continued relationships with their land and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tutelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous students, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to ut prosim, that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. <clears throat> so thank you for letting me read that. Hi, Key Squared, how are you today? Um, I just got a friendly reminder from the captioner to turn on captions that are already on. So that, I, honestly, that's better than telling it to give me a reminder and not getting one. Um, so anyway, uh, what we're looking at today is <laughs> Godey's Ladies Book. Um, this is actually the first issues here. Um, and they're tied up because honestly, the covers on this book are no longer attached. Uh, these are the latest issues that we have and you'll see there are no covers on this book at all. Um, and I pulled a, a selection sort of throughout the run of the magazine. Most of these have been rebound um, or, I mean, because these would have been paper magazines that uh, would not have had hardcovers, but they've been bound into books. Happy to finally be back in the office after some maintenance issues. <clears throat> that, is, uh, that is good. I'm glad that you're happy to be back in the office. Um, Looking forward to the latest hot fashion tips from the 1850s. <clears throat> I definitely have, this volume is 1855. So we could definitely look for the hottest fashion tips from the 1850s. That is a thing we can do today. Um, but I should probably start by looking up what exactly is Godey's Ladies Book? Uh, and giving a little bit of a primer. <clears throat> Just gonna look it up on my phone so I can still see chat on both, both channels. Godey's Ladies Book, other alternatively known as Godey's Magazine and Ladies Book, was an American women's magazine that was published in Philadelphia from 1830 to 1878. It was the most widely circulated magazine in the period before the American Civil War. Its circulation rose from 70,000 in the 1840s to 150,000 in 1860. In the 1860s, Godey's considered itself the queen of monthlies. So it would publish an issue once a month. Um, and thankfully, this magazine is a smaller format and will actually fit on camera much better than uh, the Ladies' Home Journal that we looked at last week. Um, so... <laughs> That is, uh, that is what we're gonna do today. We're gonna just explore and see what the 1860s or 1840s through the 1860s have to offer us. <clears throat> Let's see. 
how I want to position this camera. And yeah, that's not terrible. We'll just switch over to the document focus, top down view on the camera, and we'll see what we've got. Unsurprisingly, it is ridiculously hot in this room yet again. Uh, so I apologize if that starts to trigger my sinuses. Um, this is by far the hottest room I spend any time in during the entire week. <clears throat> so, um, let's see, we've got this issue, which I'm just gonna move the cover out of the way because <clears throat> it's lovely to have on there for when it sits on a shelf, but for actually interacting with the volume, trying to keep it in place will actually be confusing. gentle here. Ah, so we're starting with volume two. That This is the oldest volume that we have here. Uh, the ladies book. Volume two. I love the illustrations in it. Um, it's very Americana in its illustration here with the eagle <clears throat> and sort of like the, the Greco-Roman influence with the harp and the cornucopia and stuff like that. A uh, little um, angelic creatures with the wings. Not biblically accurate angelic creatures, but angelic creatures as envisioned through Renaissance art, etc. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> Published by L.A. Godey <coughs> and Company number 112 Chestnut, Chestnut Street, opposite the post office, 1831. Hi, Hannah. Welcome in. How are you today? <coughs> Pardon me. <laughs> he squared. Um, they are indeed not disembodied eyes, although disembodied eyes seems very accurate if you want a biblical portrayal of an angel. Um, Chestnut Street, your shop is located on Chestnut Street. Probably not this, no, not the same Chestnut Street. This is Philadelphia. Uh, so yeah, not the same. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think those are supposed to be flowers, key squared. That definitely seems much more likely for this illustration um, in volume two of the ladies book. Uh, so this is 1831, it looks like. And the paper is yellow. It's not just yellowed with age, it's actually yellow. I'm trying to turn the page, getting a grip on the page itself is actually rather challenging at the moment. They remind you of Beholder Eyes. They definitely do evoke eye. All right, I'm gonna turn the page. I'm being as gentle as I can because this, this is an old item. I, I can't do the math myself. This is 1831 and my brain will not want to do that math in my head. Um, if someone wants to tell me how many years old this item is, or can do the maths, or can have the Google do the maths, that would be lovely. Hello, Lord Portico. <laughs> 191 years, thank you. <laughs> It was a long time ago, but uh, not as long ago as, uh, as when this book was published. We get our first glimpse of fashion. <clears throat> and color 
illustration. So the one on the left, the pink dress, is labeled evening dress. And the one on the right, the blue one, is labeled walking dress. Uh, these are labeled Philadelphia Fashions. Published for the ladies' book by L.A. Godey, January 1831. Um, the initial part of this book is in very poor shape. Um, as you can see, I have partial pages at the beginning here. <clears throat> so we've got page three here, which is truncated, uh, up through page five, which is truncated. We have a bottom portion of what appears to be page nine. Um, I think. I don't, I don't know if it's printed. I mean, I assume it is. Like, I don't think they manually colored them in. It looks to me similar to like a screen printing process. Um, but I'm not certain. I would have to investigate the technology to know for sure how the color printing was done. They're very vibrant colors. How about we find out? If we, if we can. We, we can search and see what we can learn about uh, 1830s color printing. 1830s color printing. <coughs> Oh, in, so this is before this, uh, but in 1835, George Baxter patented his color printing process. I, I want... So that's not super useful for me. what I can find. Chromozylography was a color woodblock pr printing process popular from the mid-19th to the early 20th century, commonly used to produce illustrations in children's books, serial pulp magazines, and cover art for Yellowback and Penny Dreadfuls. just says mid-19th century. And it looks similar to this. So my guess is this is probably chromozylography, which is a woodblock process. So they would have carved the um, illustration into a woodblock in relief and then inked it and used that to do the actual illustration on the page. I don't know. Seem, seems valid to me. <clears throat> Let's see here. So as you can see, the very... the. the the front of the book is also not attached. As I mentioned before, the cover was not attached. Uh, this first section of papers here, also not attached, or section of pages. Um, we will continue gently. Oh my gosh, 16-bit Eric, hello, and thank you for the bits. Welcome. And so we still have pages that are uh, torn. <laughs> um, let's see, I'm, I'm gonna try and find us 
the beginning of something. The beginning of something where the pages are not so damaged that I am scared to interact with them, uh, which is probably going to be me looking for volume two or the February edition. Ooh. Here, here we have another, at the very end of the January edition, a very, another very tattered. <laughs> Hi, Puddle Glam, how are you? <laughs> Hooray on getting out of your work meeting early. Um, so, as was common in the day, uh, we've got an illustration, um, and we have essentially tissue paper bound into the book that is meant to protect the illustration. Um, <clears throat> the, the tissue paper is in very bad condition. The actual page with the illustration is in very bad condition also. But we have uh, the village school in an uproar. And, and this is actually the beginning of the ladies' book for February. <laughs> but yeah, um, the students there do seem to be rather unruly, but look at this professor with the switch in his hand coming through the door. He looks positively demonic. I, I, I'm gonna zoom in because you all need to see this professor that's entering the room here. Do you see him over there? Just the expression on that face. <clears throat> All the kids are, you know, <clears throat> rambunctious. Apparently they're destroying things. There's a hole in the floor. It looks like maybe one of the windows is broken. They're drawing on the door. They're, they've got one of the, the benches turned over and they're tumbling around on the ground. Somebody's lost their apple. It's, it's flying away. And the professor standing in the doorway with that wicked switch in his hand. <laughs> oh no, your time travel has been discovered. Oh, I, I've slipped it up a little bit too far, but just wow. <laughs> Let's cover him up. <clears throat> so let's see. Let's take a look at the art era where they didn't really know how to paint children. They all look like very short men rather than actual boys. Indeed, indeed, yes. So here we are, February 1831. And there's a piece here entitled, The School. No author given. No class of breathing beings, either brute or rational, represents a greater variety of individual character than that to which we assign the generic name of schoolmaster. Could a Congress be assembled of those who in any large city have devoted themselves to what, according to the disposition and qualifications of him that undertakes it, may be regarded as one of the noblest or the meanest of human pursuits? Could each be induced to give a full and candid relation of the motives and circumstances that first threw him into that line of life and subsequently confined him to it? What rich materials for a most instructive and entertaining volume would a selection from these afford to a writer acquainted with the human heart and skilled in the ways of the world? The herd of those, too numerous by far, who would be found to regard their profession as a trade to which they had been drawn by the expectation of earning a decent livelihood without much active exertion of either mind or body, might be dismissed and forgotten. But there would be left the scholar who had started in life rich in mental, uh, rich in mental acquirements, but poor in everything else. <clears throat> possessing every talent but that for battling stoutly with fortune and every dis and 
and, early disgusted with the strife of the busy world, leaving the field to rivals inferior to himself in all but hardihood. His services are accepted in a public or a private school, where he sits down to his labors, resolved to be contented with a condition inferior to that which he was once confident of reaching, and to exert himself strenuously for reputation and promotion. He is to be regarded as one of the best and happiest of the assemblage, but will his patience hold out? Will his health and his intellectual vigor stand the trial? Will his merits, when an opportunity offers to reward them, succeed against the patronage that may be enlisted in favor of an incompetent seeker of the post to which he feels himself entitled to aspire? He hopes so now, and let us leave him trusting that he is not doomed to disappointment. So basically, uh, laying out that, hey, the schoolmaster? He's really intelligent, but really didn't like the, like trying to get ahead in business and make lots of money. So instead, he chose an intellectual pursuit that will leave him in poverty the rest of his life. Yeah, so nothing has changed. That, that's what I take from it. <laughs> 1831, we have a story titled, The Lottery Ticket. <clears throat> we're really going to drive home how much things are still like they were in the 1830s, apparently. Mr. Richard For uh, Fogram, Fogram, Mr. Richard Fogram, or as his old acquaintances would more familiarly than respectfully designate, designate him, Dick Fogram, or as he was sometimes styled on the superscription of a letter from a tradesman or poor relation, Richard Fogram Esquire, had for some years retired from business, although he had not yet passed what is called the Middle Age. And turning his back on his shop, where he had made, if not a considerable fortune, at least handsome competency, rented a small house at, at Hackney, or as he was pleased to term it, in the country. His establishment united a due attention to comfort with economy and prudence. Besides a kitchen maid and an occasional chairwoman or errand boy, Mr. Fogram possessed, in the person of the trusty Sally Salvins, an excellent superintendent of his little menage. Sally was not exactly gouvernante or housekeeper. At least she assumed none of the dignity attached to such a post. She seemed indeed hardly to have a will or opinion of her own but had so insensibly accommodated herself to her employer's ways and humors that by degrees the apparent distance between master and servant diminished. And as Sally, though far from talkative herself, was a good listener, Mr. Fulgram began to find a pleasure in relating to her all the little news and anecdotes he usually picked up in his daily walk. Let it not, however, be supposed that there was anything equivocal in the kind of unconscious courtesy which existed between these two personages. A single glance at Sally would have convinced the most ingenious fabricator of scandal and dealer in innuendos that there was no foundation on which to build even the slightest surmise of the kind, for both Sally's, uh, both Sally's person and face were to her a shield that would have rebutted any notion of the sort uh, that author just called Sally really ugly in the terminology of 1831. It, I should say in the um, respectable upper class terminology of 1831, he just called Sally really ugly. <clears throat> I have lost my spot. Ah. Alas, that nature so extolled by every poet for her imp impartiality should be at times so capricious in her favors and bestow her gifts so grudgingly even on those whose very sex entitles them to, con to be considered fair. Kind goddess, as Will of Avon styles thee, surely thou didst in this instance behave most unfairly, bestowing on Sally Saladin's an elevation of, fi of figure that had she been of the other sex, might have raised her to the rank of a corporal or grenadier of grenadiers. 
Yet if thou gavest her an aspiring stature, thou gavest her no aspiring thoughts. And if thou didst deny to her softness of person, fortunately for her peace, thou didst not gift her with the least susceptibility of heart. If Sally was not lovable, there was no woman on earth who could possibly have regretted it less. She had heard people talk of love, and she supposed, if indeed she ever bestowed a thought on the subject, that there must be something in the world so-called, otherwise people would not have invented a name for it. So she was aromantic. They have just described an aromantic person. I know, this story did not have to go this hard. <clears throat> but 1831, in this fiction piece, we have a character who is described as aromantic. Uh, but she could no more pretend to say what it was than to describe the ingredients of the air she breathed. In short, Sally was the most guileless, guileless, simple, and disinterested of mortals that ever entered beneath the roof of a single gentleman to be the first servant where there was no mistress. Well, therefore, might Mrs. Toms, who was aware that elderly gentlemen in her dear uncle's situation were not always gifted with that discretion that beseems their years, but sometimes commit themselves to wedlock in an unwary moment to the, no, to the no small prejudice of their affectionate relatives, well, I say might the prudent Miss Tom, Mrs. Toms congratulate herself on having found such a treasure so invaluable a jewel as Sally Saladin's. She was certain that from this quarter, at least, there was nothing to be apprehended, nothing to intercept her dear uncle's three percents from what she considered the legitimate object of their destination. <laughs> so Mrs. Toms set him up with this housekeeper because there was absolutely no way that this housekeeper might marry uh, her uncle and therefore rob her of her rightful inheritance, is what this just said. <clears throat> I'm, I'm still curious about where the lottery ticket comes in. Uh, some alarm indeed had been excited in her mind by hearing that Mr. Fulgram had, seen rather frequent, had been seen rather frequently of late knocking at the door of Mrs. Simpson, but then again she thought he could not possibly be led thither by any other motive than that of chatting away an hour with the widow of an old friend. Beside, this lady was not likely either to lead or to be led into matrimony. In her younger days, Mrs. Simpson might have been pretty, but none of her acquaintance could recollect when. She still patched, yet the patch was applied not where co coquetry would have placed it, but where necessity dictated, namely over the left eye. So she still put on makeup, but not where uh, someone would put makeup if they were trying to attract a mate, but rather where it was absolutely required. Boy, this book really doesn't like women. Impromptu content warning. Today we are reading literature from 1831, which may contain stereotypes of women that may be demeaning or uh, denigrating. Please be mindful as we move through this content and take a moment away if it becomes overwhelming. Yeah, Lord Portico, thank you for that. Um, and indeed, this is a, an archive stream where we read things from history. And uh, this is 1831 America. <clears throat> I know Puddle Glove! This is a women's magazine! <coughs> uh, Mrs. Toms therefore concealed herself, consoled herself with the reflection that it was better her uncle should knock at Mrs. Simpson's door than at that of a more attractive fair one. No, her uncle, she was perfectly satisfied, would never marry. What have you got there, Sally? said Mr. Fulgram to his housekeeper one day as she drew something from her pocket while standing before the sideboard opposite to him. Ain't please you, sir, replied Sally in a meek but not, uh, but not very gentle voice. It's a bit of summat I was going to show you. You know, sir, my Uncle Tim took leave of me yesterday before he goes to sea again, and so he gave me this paper, which he says may chance to turn up trumps and make me comfortable for life. Definitely 1800s writing style, yeah. Rykar, thank you for your resubscription for 15 months. Welcome back. Uh, 
Well, let me see what it is. Sally, is it the old fellow's will? Huh. Why, Sally, this is a lottery ticket. A whole lottery ticket. Yet I will venture to say not worth more than the rag of paper tis printed on. I, my, I have myself tried the lottery times and, and often ere now and not got anything but disappointment. A blank, sir, a blank. That was the only answer I ever obtained. Uh, oh, a blank, sir, a blank. That was the only answer I ever attained from them. What could possibly induce your uncle to lay out his cash in so foolish a manner? Tis never worth either keeping or thinking about. Number 123, confound it. I know it well. I once purchased a share of it myself, the very first I ever bought when I was quite a lad, and, well, I do recollect that I chose it out of a whole heap and thought myself very fortunate in obtaining one with such a sequence of figures. One, two, three. You can't tell yet if this is supposed to be a humorous story, if this is going to take a dark turn. Yeah, I have no idea, Puddle Glum. I, I don't know what to expect from this. Most composedly did Sally take the ticket again, not at all disconcerted at this denunciation of ill luck, but on the contrary, with a calmness worthy of a stoic. Tis true, she did not, like patience of a monument, absolutely smile at grief. But then Sally never smiled, nor would a smile perhaps if, nor would a smile perhaps if the rigidity of her face would have permitted such a relaxation of its muscles have tended greatly to heighten the attractions of her countenance. Author, really? Do you really have to keep harping on how you do not consider Sally Saladins to be attractive? Is that truly necessary? <clears throat> Her master, in the meanwhile, continued eating and wondering, and wondering and eating, until he could neither eat nor wonder more. But dismissing Sally with the dinner things, turned himself quietly to the fire and took his pipe. Mrs. Toms was sitting one morning, cogitating on some mischief that she again began to apprehend from the widow Simpson, in consequence of certain intelligence she had the day before received respecting the lady's designs upon the person of her uncle, when she was suddenly startled from her reverie by a loud rapping at the door, and instantly afterwards, who should enter the parlor but the very subject of her meditations, Mrs. Simpson herself. Welcome to the Ladies' Self-Esteem Destroyer Quarterly. No, it's a monthly Lord Portico. <laughs> Subtitle, yikes! <laughs> oh, and, and we have had someone uh, who identifies as a woman chime in that that is most women's magazines. A, a regular issue of women's self-esteem de self -esteem destroyer. So I guess we're right on track, or beginning the trend. The appearance of so unusual a visitor would alone have sufficed to surprise her, but there was something in the good lady's manner and countenance that denoted she came upon a very important errand. Why, Mrs. Toms, exclaimed she, almost breathless, as soon as she entered, have you heard? Your uncle! Good heavens, cried Mrs. Toms, what do you mean? What has happened? My poor dear uncle, ill, dying? Compose yourself, Mrs. Toms, not dying, but I thought you might have heard. Heard what? Some accident, I suppose? Poor dear man. No, no accident, returned the widow, who by this time had somewhat recovered her breath, but something very strange, most unaccountable. What you may think of, I know, what you may think of it, I know not, but for my part, I think that Mr. Fulgram has acted, I shall not say how. And pray, ma'am, said Mrs. Toms, who now began to think that it was some quarrel between them of which the widow came to inform her, what has Mr. Fulgram done that you should come in this strange manner and make so great a fuss about it? Is it some nonsense after all, I dare say? Nonsense, forsooth! Well, I declare. However, it certainly is no business of mine, ma'am, returned Mrs. Simpson. Well, then why did you bring it up? who quite nettled at her reception, and I suppose you know what has taken place and I up and approve of it. I have nothing further to say. Mrs. Toms now became unaffectedly alarmed, and apprehending she knew not what, 
requested to be informed what had happened without further delay. Why, ma'am, then, Mr. Fulgram is married, that's all. To describe the effects these words had upon Mrs. Toms would be impossible, and to paint the expression of her countenance equally unavailing. Married? Sh screamed she out at length as soon as she could draw her breath. Married? Impossible. To whom? To whom? To Sally Saladin's, ma'am. To Sally Saladin's? Impossible. You must be joking. Not I, I assure you. I'm not a person, Mrs. Toms, to make such jokes. I myself saw them less than an hour ago pass by my window in a post-chaise together, and then learnt the whole story from those who saw them step into it at the church door. Oh! Mrs. Simpson, how have I been deceived in that insinuating hussy Sally Saladins? She who seemed so staid, so discreet, so very unlikely a person. What an old fool he must be to marry so vulgar a frump! <laughs> I just... I'm... okay. Nay, do not agitate yourself, my dear ma'am, said Mrs. Simpson, who now having dis disburdened burthened herself of her secret and her own mortification being perhaps carried off by that of Mrs. Toms, which acted as a conductor to it, had quite regained her composure. For my part, I hope he may not repent of his match. Oh, Toms, exclaimed the other lady as her husband entered the room. Here is news for us. My silly old uncle has actually this very morning married his maidservant. This is most confoundedly unlucky, cried Toms, though I much doubted whether all your management and maneuvering would, uh, for which you gave yourself so much credit would be to any purpose. So the husband comes in, she complains that it's happened, and he proceeds to belittle her, saying that all of her endeavors weren't going to amount to anything anyway. Ahem. <clears throat> But who could dream of such a thing? I have no patience with him for having married as he, as he has done. Well, my dear, there's no helping it, and perhaps, after all, since he is married, it is quite as well for us that he has chosen as he has. You're absolutely cheering for Sally in this story? A, a vulgar frump! Indeed, Lord Portico! <laughs> <coughs> uh, I'm wondering if this is a moralizing tale? trying to tell uh, busybody women to stay out of their relatives' lives. I'm, I'm not certain yet, though. While Mrs. Toms was ejaculating and bewailing, now abusing poor Sally as an artful, seducing woman who, under the mask of the greatest simplicity, had contrived to work upon her uncle's weakness, and anon venting her reproaches against the latter for suffering himself to be thus duped, a post-chaise was seen rolling along the road to... rolling ro along the road to... Uh, with the identical pair seated in it, who were the subject of this... <clears throat> invective? Invective and clamor. <coughs> I do think it is meant to be humorous at this point. I, I agree. The intelligence of which Mrs. Simpson had been the unwelcome messenger was, in fact, correct in every particular. For Richard Fulgram, single man and Sally Saladin's spinster, had this very morning been lawfully united in wedlock, although, but a few days before, <clears throat> had anyone prognosticated such an event, they would no, mo no more have believed it possible than Mrs. Toms herself. <clears throat> and now, my dear Sally, said the somewhat stale Benedict, laying his hand rather gently than amorously on that of the bride, for which, by the by, it was really no match in size. I doubt not, but my niece will be in a towering passion when she hears of this. However, no matter, lest let her and the rest of the world say what they please. I do not see why a man may not just as well follow his own fancies as those of other persons. Besides Sally, though folks may think that I might have <clears throat> made a more advantageous match, in point of fortune at least, they may perhaps be in error. I have a piece of intelligence to communicate, of which perhaps you little dream. You recollect th that lottery ticket? 
Well, passing the lucky corner by the mansion house two days ago, I beheld, pasted up at the window, number one, two, three, twenty thousand pounds. Ha! Ha! Sally! Well did, I re well, did I recollect those figures again. One, two, three. They follow each other as naturally as A, B, C. So home I came, but determined to say nothing of the matter till now. <clears throat> the reader has already been informed that Sally was the most phlegmatic of her sex. Still, it may be supposed that such an interesting disclosure would have elicited some ejaculation of exultation, even from the lips of a stoic. <clears throat> Yet Sally, with wonderful composure, merely replied, La! Now that is curious. Curious? Yes, but I assure you it is quite true. I am not joking. Well, what an odd turn things do sometimes take. Odd indeed, for who would have thought that my identical unlucky number, one, two, three, should bring you, I may say us, Sally, 20,000 pounds. But sir, Mr. Fulgram, you are mistaken, I mean to say. No mistake at all, my dear, quite certain of it. Took down the numbers in my pocketbook. See here, one, two, three, twenty thousand pounds. Is that not the number of your ticket? Yes, but, but what? Why, you won't hear me, Mr. Fulgram, said Mally mildly. <clears throat> I was only going to say that two months ago I sold the ticket. How? What? Sold? Groaned out poor Fulgram and sank sunk gasping against the side of the chaise. Now pray don't distress yourself, Mr. Fulgram, said Sally, who, without the least visible emotion or any change in her tone, did you not yourself tell me it was not worth keeping? So I thought, well, Master must know better about these matters than I. Therefore, I may as well make something of it while I can, so I changed it away for this nice white shawl, which the man said was quite a bargain. Only do feel how fine it is. Sally, woman, a bargain? Twenty thousand pounds! <clears throat> Here, let me drop the curtain, for none but a master hand could do justice to the bridegroom's feelings, and I will not impair the effect by attempting to heighten it. I have only to add that Mr. Fulgram eventually regained his usual composure and was once known even to relate the story himself over a glass of his best whiskey as a droll anecdote of his life. Matrimony made no visible alteration in his menage, nor in his bride, for the only difference it caused with respect to the latter was that she sat at table instead of standing by the sideboard, that she was now called Mrs. Fulgram instead of Sally Saladin's. That is a plot worthy of, uh, worthy of a television episode. <laughs> from uh, Downton Abbey. I, like, I, I could see that as like an episode of Downton Abbey or a, a plot line in Downton Abbey or some, some such. Um, the moral here is that mansplaining is a costly sport indeed. <laughs> it actually was a really good story um, apart from the rather unnecessary, uh, unnecessarily abusive descriptions of the women involved. <clears throat> it was definitely, uh, the comeuppance at the end was, was really good. Like, it was clear he only married her because she had probably won the lottery, and then to find that um, he admits to her that he only married her because she won the lottery, and for him to, to say, oh, but I sold the ticket because you said it wasn't worth anything. Just absolute perfection. <clears throat> <laughs> Sorry, I got distracted by an item here titled Servian Patriotism. Patriotism. And I'm curious if this is what we know today as Serbia. And if it has, if it's fiction or non-fiction. Dissolution of the National Assembly of Serbia, Prince Miloš took occasion to read the deputies a lesson on their civic duties during which he introduced the following remarkable instance of self-devotion of, of parental feelings to the public good. Though few of you, he said, have not frequently afforded 
unequivocal proofs of your patriotism, yet there is one example of eminent virtue which <clears throat> Militi... Jevanowitz has displayed for our mutual emulation that deserves to be publicly known. At these words, he presented to them a common peasant from the district of Symmendria, whose age might be about 50. <clears throat> <clears throat> you got distracted by distinguished females? I can look at that one in a second. Uh, this man had only one son who, in conjugation with two youths, murdered a stranger five years ago and threw the body into Morava, into the Morava. Out of the money found on the stranger's person, Milty's son received for his share 18 uh, piastres, between five and six shillings, and a brace of pistols. He buried both in order to avoid any inquiry on his father's part, and shortly afterward, one of his companions fell ill and died whilst the other was drowned in the Morava. The murder remained a secret to everyone but Milty's, Milty's son, after a lapse of years during which there was no inquiry after the murdered man, nor any finding of his body, and by the death of his accessories, every chance of discovery was removed, Mility's son dug up the arms and money, and bringing them home was so closely questioned by his parent that he at length revealed the dreadful secret to him. However impossible it was that the bare suspicion of it should be apprehended, the father instantly discerned the path which, uh, which duty prescribed, he bound the murderer, and delivering him over to the hand of justice, said with a quivering lip, This is my son, my only child. We have all sworn to be true to our rulers and our prince, and not to endure the presence of a wicked, of a wicked being amongst us. My son is a murderer. Let the ends of justice be consummated. Upon this virtuous parent I have bestowed the life of his child. Before the National Assembly of Servia separated, Prince Milosh was enthusiastically selected by Sovereign Prince of his native land, or was enthusiastically elected sovereign prince of his native land with descent of the dignity of his male heirs. <clears throat> he appears to have deserved this high honor by his long years of faithful service, and there can be little doubt that uh, Mahmud will confirm the election, for it is quite in unison with the wishes of Nicholas. See, now I'm curious. Historical English term taken from the Greek language to refer to Serbia. I still don't know if it's true or if it's a, a fluff tale that was written, <clears throat> but it is indeed about Serbia. All right, so uh, you, you were interested in distinguished females, and then it's probably well past time that we move beyond 1830, because I have a couple other decades to look at. Um, Calperna, the wife of Julius Caesar, was at once the object of his love and admiration. Her wit amused, her understanding charmed, and her sweetness captivated the conqueror of the world. Her mind had been cultivated with the nicest care, and her manners were formed upon the most perfect model. Anxious to promote the happiness of her people, she is, she in fact became their idol, and it is difficult to say whether she was most venerated, loved, or esteemed. Plotina, wife of the Emperor Trajan, was as much celebrated for the sweetness of her manners as she was for the solidity of her judgment and the refinement of her understanding, and so thoroughly was the Emperor acquainted with the capability of her intellectual powers that he always consulted her upon affairs of importance. Yet this flattering compliment to her abilities neither filled her with pride or puffed her up with presumption, for her humility was equal to her penetration and her affability to her judgment, and so great was the ascendancy she obtained over the emperor that historians ascribe many of his noble acts to the influence of her virtues. Agrippina, wife of Germanicus, was a woman in whom were united great talents, exalted virtues, and refined delicacy. <clears throat> her perfections were found in an in 
in on an innate principle founded. <clears throat> Let me try that again. Her perfections were founded upon an innate principle of virtue, which withstood the pernicious effects of bad example. For her mother's character was as much disgraced by censure as her own was adorned with praise. The eldest daughter of the illustrious Chancellor, Thomas More, was a wise and amiable lady. <clears throat> her learning was almost eclipsed by her virtues. She corresponded in Latin with, with the great Erasmus, who styled her the ornament of Britain. After she had consoled her father in prison, had rushed through the guards to snatch a last embrace, had obtained a li the liberty of paying him funeral honors, had purchased his head with gold, she was herself loaded with fetters for two crimes, for having kept the head of her father as a relic, and for having preserved his books and writings. She appeared before her judges with in, uh, intrepidity, justified herself with that eloquence which virtue bestows on injured merit, commanded adoration, uh, <clears throat> commanded admiration and respect, and passed the rest of her life in retirement, in melancholy, and in study. Interesting. This is actually, um, this series, this, this title of uh, Godi's Ladies Book actually gets fairly frequent use from our collections. Um, it's a well-known women's magazine from history and uh, so gets used somewhat frequently uh, for study purposes. An illustration titled The Three Sisters to start the March one. And uh, so this illustration is paired with the initial story. So the initial story in the March issue is The Three Sisters. Um, and in some ways this reminds me of the like illustrations that we got when we were looking at the Edgar Allan Poe book. Ooh, color illustration again. Uh, here we are, April fashions. So I guess these would be spring fashions for 1831. I don't know if they had shifted to like, let's give them the fashions for next season now. Or if these were, here's what you should be wearing today. Uh, so I'm uncertain if these are spring or summer fashions for 1831, but we have Philadelphia fashions. On the left is a walking dress, and on the right is an evening dress. <clears throat> Key squared, I've got, I've got your, your latest fashions from the 1830s. Although I think you said you wanted to see the fashions from the 1850s, so we'll have to skip ahead a few years. More complex shading in those plates. I don't know, uh, but it's only been a couple of months at this point, so I still think it's a woodblock. Sort of the hashing of the shading does look like um, uh, it does look like woodblock to me. Oh, Fluid Anne. Hi. Um, yeah, daylight savings, Fluid Anne. Uh, everything is an hour earlier this week. Um, <laughs> I, I'm ready for them to um, start let it, allowing withdrawals on all of this daylight saving that I've been doing my whole life. I would very much like to, um, to withdraw some of what I have saved up. I am definitely not at my peak uh, this week. Like, no day this week have I felt like I was operating to my peak efficiency because I, my body has not adjusted to the fact that I should be up an hour earlier than it once, than, because it didn't want to get up when I needed to get up before. And now I'm asking it to get up an hour earlier because my body doesn't care that the clock changed. Um, 
We have a lovely sea scene here. It doesn't have a title, but the title of the story it's paired with is uh, Picture of Philadelphia. Oh, no, it, it does have a title. It is titled Philadelphia. Checks the interest rate on your daylight saving account and looks very disappointed. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord Portico, for, uh, for taking care of me with the posture check on the hydrate. As it is mid-March, mid-March I tend to wear a lot of green, and so I wore my, my green sleeveless sweater today, uh, since we still do not have the green screen installed. So I can wear it. <clears throat> Anywho, I'm gonna just skip ahead because I want to end this book and move on to the next one. Um, and yes, still in pieces, this one is. I will have to um, <clears throat> tie it all back together with the cloth tape when the stream is over. Um, but we have cotton tape to hold it together. Um, that is right there, and so I will tie things up um, after I sign off. Let's move along and jump forward a little bit in time. Our next volume, I do not know what year it is. Uh, it is volume 15 of the ladies' book. Apparently this was the property of Constance, Constance A.P. Nightingale and the property of Thomas F. Carpenter. I do not know who either of them are, but uh, at some point we got their copies. Uh, this appears to be Thomas Carpenter's signature here in, from Providence, Rhode Island. <clears throat> All right, let's see here. We have a lovely illustration to start us off. Very, uh, I don't know, feels very like gothic romance, this illustration. Uh, we do have the tissue paper to protect the illustration. Uh, it does have a signature. But as this is a signature, I do not know what it says. Because this is not a cursive title or something. This is, I'm guessing, an artist's signature. And um, I am not, sure, not certain what it says. This could be B, E, Y? D-I something A-C-H-I possibly? I, I'm not certain. That would be something that would I would need to research if I needed to find out. Um, but this is the ladies book and magazine of Bell Letters I'm going to zoom in so that you can kind of Kind of looks like Benjamin Disraeli. Is that an artist that we should be familiar with? Is that a, an actual like artist of the time? Uh, signature. See, na now I'm curious. It 
does have some similarity. The B is, the way that the B is written is the same. The D there is definitely different though. Um, But that, I, I don't know dates on these examples that I'm seeing, so it's possible that the D changed. You can definitely uh, change the way that you write letters over time. That is a thing that can happen. Uh, I think you may be right, and this may possibly be a Benjamin Disraeli signature or, or illustration. Um, But I, it, it would take a little bit of researching specifically Disraeli autographs to discover if this was him or not. Um, so most of the signatures that I'm seeing are first initial, last name. Um, and the D is definitely formed differently in those cases. Um, and I, I, I don't know. The B was very similar on some of them. But the fact that this ends with a tail like that before going into the D seems like maybe not. But then I could definitely see that being Disraeli as the last name. Uh, so comparing signatures is a thing that you have to pay attention not just to the formulation of the letters, which varies from signature to signature, but generally have the same shapes. And so the fact that there's the tail at the beginning of the B, there's the loop, there's the thing, and it ends in a dot that doesn't connect, that was similar to one of the signatures of Benjamin, Benjamin Disraeli that I saw. So that's evidence for it being his signature. But... Um, on the other hand, you also have to pay attention to the date and time. So uh, this would have been an item from a year that I have not established yet, 1837. Uh, and it's possible that the signature that I was seeing an example of online is from later than that, just based on the art styles that I was seeing associated with the signatures I was seeing. Uh, they looked more refined. They looked um, sort of more detailed than this sketch. So I'm guessing that they were probably later works, but I would have to take the time to dig into it, see the dates on them, see if I could find examples from the late 1830s of his signature to see. Uh, so there's a good possibility, but I, I can't say for certain because it would require a lot of research in order to determine um, if this was indeed his work. And, and, and like, this is a print. This is not an original signature, so that um, yeah, British politician of the era, not super relevant. Printmaster of England in 1870. So it's possible, but who knows? I was going to zoom in on the, the title plate here, um, which is somewhat difficult to read. Uh, sorry, let me shift the book so that you can see what I'm looking at. Oh, too far. I love the delay between when I do something and when it shows up on stream, um, which means that trying to adjust where the camera is positioned is always fun. All right, here we go. The Ladies' Book and Magazine of Bell Letters, Fashions, Music, etc. Volume 15. But Reichardt, if he was printmaster of England in 1870, uh, or in the 1870s, this would have been like work of his from 40 years earlier. So it's also entirely possible that it is him. Um, and I'm scared now because it looked like my computer was trying to run some updates, but I think that it has passed. Uh, all right, we've got The Ladies' Book, July 1837, The Wealth of Nature. We have 
line drawings this time to start. Uh, Friedolin ordered to attend the Holy Mass. And Friedolin serves as sacristan at Mass. Um, second. About halfway through stream, every time uh, one of my devices signs out of what I need it to be in. Um, so I just needed to sign back in. There we go. Okay. Let's see. I'm, I, I'm really interested to see if we find some more fashion. We can always read another story, uh, but we definitely have a lot more decades to go through. And I don't know why uh, a little bit of Minnesota was slipping into my accent there. It just was. Let's see. Of Lucretia and Maria Davidson. Grace Tiverton. Oh, we have music. She is thine and only thine. A very popular ballad. As sung by Mrs. Wood, composed by, composed by T. Labar, just published by J.G. Osborne and presented to the ladies' book. I love that popular is spelled P-U-P-U-L-A-R. Uh, I don't know if that means that it is a ballad liked by dogs, in that it is popular, uh, or if that is just a misprint or what, but I, I like the idea of the word popular. Um, I'm probably not going to be singing this. Yeah, I'm not going to be sight reading songs um, live on the internet while different music plays in my ears. It's just not going to happen. Uh, but I do appreciate that they, they were printing music because this is this would have been something you could have taken this issue and put it up on your piano in the drawing room and, you know, you and your friends could have had a sing-along. The Tortoise Shell Spectacles. The Lady's Mentor. Oh. Here we are. Six years later, uh, we have another color illustration. It does appear to be a woodblock print again, although not as precise as six years previous. The feathers in her fan in particular seem to have, they just seem very much less precise. There's bleed across the image. They honestly, the feathers of her fan look more like they were filled in with watercolor than they do uh, as if they were applied by a woodblock print. Um, I don't believe that they were. It's just that certain areas, uh, like this bow here, look more like they were applied with watercolor than woodblock. Clara, wife to Marikal Schomburg. So I think this is supposed to be a portrait of an actual person. Which makes me wonder about the eyes. I, I don't know how well you can see the eyes. The eyes are not um, looking in the same direction. They are not both looking in the same direction. So if this is indeed an image of an actual person, that's probably a visual impairment or a visual, um, uh, probably a, 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 an issue with eye muscles or something that the actual person had. Uh, if it's an illustration of somebody who is fictional, I would have to see what the story said about the person. Uh, but it, the, the eyes are definitely not both looking in the same direction. So.
uncertain as to the reasoning behind that. Usually the image has matched with the story on the next page, so let's see if, uh, if this story happens to be about this person. A glance at it, I don't actually think it is just based on the title, but it's possible. Uh, so this is Clara, wife to Marichal, M-A-R-I-C-H-A-L, Mar Marichal Schomburg. Marichal Schomburg. Um, and I definitely do not see the name Clara anywhere in this facing story, so I don't actually think it's about her. I think it's, I think, I think this is a celebrity photo. It's a women's magazine, and I think here in 1837 we have a celebrity photo. And, and this is essentially the cover photo. We have Clara, wife to Marshall Schomburg, is the cover model for this issue of the ladies book. University of Virginia's archive says some of these plates were actually hand colored by staff before being sent out. So this one would seem to have been hand colored then rather than uh, mass done via woodblock print. But yeah, I, th I think this is our first celebrity cover photo that we've seen, that we've seen. I would, I would have to pull the other issues and I, I didn't pull the issues between 1831 and 1837 um, to see, because I wasn't thinking about that, but this definitely appears to be a celebrity, an illustration of an actual, like, famous person uh, as the cover to this women's magazine, which I think is absolutely amazing. 1837, they're putting famous people on the cover of the magazine. Let's see what we can find next. Um, we've got another song. Oh, Doubt Not, a song composed and arranged for the piano forte by Peters. Presented by J.G. Osborne for the ladies' book. J.G. Osborne. Why do I know the name J.G. Osborne? J.G. Osborne. I don't know. A quick search doesn't really come up. There's a scholarship at Prairie View A&M University named for a J.G. Osborne, but I don't know if it's the same person. There's a J.G. Osborne Elementary School in Houston. I don't know why I know the name J.G. Osborne. Oh, doubt not, nor deem that my heart's like a glass can reflect other features when yours are removed. Can reflect other features when yours are removed. You have reft it of all but your image. <clears throat> Alas, if this be not loving, you have not been loved. If this be not loving, you have not been loved. And there's two more verses, and I am definitely not singing it while I have other music in my ear because I tried doing that with Christmas carols and boy, did it not work. Let's see. Are there any years in the 1800s that you would be particularly interested in seeing? If they happen to be among the books that I have pulled, um, we can definitely take a look. Lovely fashions here. We've got uh, what appear to be young people. <laughs> Let me see. There's a there's a title um, engraved. Oh, it just says engraved for the ladies' book, 1837. But this definitely appears to be children together. Uh, there's a young gentleman here. There's a young lady here, and then two even younger ladies. Uh, they appear to be in some sort of 
uh, parlor or drawing room of the time. There's a, uh, I don't, I don't know that it's a fireplace. It looks like it may just be a side table with a vase on it, with possibly a mirror behind it. Um, her dress is, is definitely colored. His coat, as you can see, is, is, he's got a green coat and a blue hat and her blue bonnet. Uh, somebody really liked the blue, but was very imprecise at applying the blue. We've got the pink dress here, but her dress does not appear to have been colored at all. Young people with 10 inch waists, you're a bit concerned. Yeah. Sorry, I saw him and I was like, Percival Frederick Stein von Musil Kowalski Tirola III. <laughs> like, I was like, yeah, that just made me think of Percy from Critical Role. Um, <laughs> just his face mostly, I think. Um, I may not linger too long in here. I do want to get to the American Civil War era before we end, and we've got like 45 minutes left, so. And this was not the entire year in this volume, uh, which I'm not certain. I was not involved in binding them, so I don't know all of the history. But this one, I think, is probably the full year, 1855. Uh, let's see what we've got for Godey's Ladies Book from 1855. So here's a thing that you all might find interesting. Do you see an image there? Because this page does not have an image on it. This is acidic bleed through on the paper from the ink that was used to... <laughs> so the, the, this is acidic bleed through on the page um, from an image that is not on the facing page. You can see the shadow of the image on the facing page too, although interestingly less pronounced on this page. The image itself is here. This image bled through to that page. Or, yeah, it's a figure in some trees, some silica. Uh, it is John proclaiming the Messiah, apparently. Um, again, this does appear to be a woodblock print. Possibly uh, a more advanced printing process. Um, as in like a metal cut, a dye, dye printing, but just the, the way that the lines are in here, the way that things are made, the hashing that is done to get the different levels of darkness, it looks like a woodcut to me. <laughs> Lord Portico, thank you for giving, uh, giving points to some silica. So interestingly, enough ink was used on this page that the acidity of the ink actually colored through the page and onto the facing page here. And now with that, you can begin to understand why it was common to put tissue paper on the illustrations because the tissue paper actually prevents that from happening. Because uh, the actual facing page here that also had an illustration, you don't get the shadow of the other illustration because there's tissue paper separating the two.
but through the regular paper, you get the, the, um, the shadow. On the tissue paper itself, you also get the shadow. Godey's Ladies Book, The Floral Offering, is what this illustration is called. Uh, let's see what we've got for this issue of the Ladies Book. Oh, we have more color illustrations here. 1855, Godey's Unrivaled Color Fashion is what this is. I can't zoom out any further. Uh, there, yeah, that's as far out as I can go. The, the, the plate's title is just Godey's Unrivaled Colored Fashion. So these are our fashions from 1855. Unfortunately, these are not labeled as to when you are intended to wear them, so I do not know if these are going out dresses or if these are staying home dresses. But honestly, the one on the right seems like it's probably the, the ball gown, the social engagement dress, whereas the one on the left appears to be a walking dress because it has the overcoat and the bonnet. So that would be my guess, is that the walking dress is on the left and the uh, ball gown is on the right. And I do think that Kaylee from uh, Firefly would absolutely love the dress on the right. <laughs> Sorry, I'm apparently going to be referencing um, nerd media today. Uh, here we have a sac de voyage and a sac à ouvrage. So sac de voyage, I mean, this is a purse. This is the bag that you take with you when you're going on a voyage. Uh, ouvrage, I'm not certain I need to look up that word. My French, I had one year of French in the fifth grade. Actually, had a little more French than that, but works. Okay, now I now I need to like suck uh, ouvrage. Ah, okay. Got it. Got it. I will translate in just a moment, unless somebody in chat already has. Yes, okay, so the top one, sac de voyage, travel bag. The bottom one, sac à ouvrage, book bag. So we have a backpack and a purse. Except I doubt this was actually worn on the back, but. Um. <laughs> but they're lovely color illustrations. This is more color than Ladies Home Journal had. And Ladies Home Journal was from 100 years later. Ooh, we have a table of contents for volume 50. Right? L is 50, right? I think so. A curious library. A few words about modern civilization. A glance at the West. A hint to the discontented. All Earth is beautiful. Alumet vases. A lock of hair, an old bachelor's soliloquy, anecdotes of Rakan, another letter from the Western wilds, Auntie Macassar Loren Loristina leaf pattern, a plea, a poet's song in de despondency, applique bracelet to be worn with the necktie, illustrated, a prodigy in arithmetic, a serenade, a serenade, a series of papers on the hair. Let's look at one of those. Page 31, a series of papers on the hair. Before I start reading this, let me just preface it by saying 
This is a ladies magazine from New England in the year 1855. I do not know what the contents of this will be. If they get exceedingly horrible, we will stop. Uh, but you may encounter viewpoints and descriptions that would not be acceptable today. Because, oh boy, were people racist in the 1850s. <clears throat> Chapter 1, Introductory. The hair of the head among all nations, civilized and savage, ancient and modern, has ever been considered an ornament to the person and is healthy, and its healthy preservation and orderly arrangement have usually occupied a considerable share of attention. Luxuriant and tastefully arranged hair certainly adds a peculiar degree of style, elegance, and finish to the features of the female face, and excites admiration in the most casual observer, and a due regard to the trim and and uh, uh, sorry, and a due regard to the trim and appearance of this appendage to the human face is not out of place even in the opposite sex, for all should cultivate and preserve the gifts which with which heaven in its good providence has has seen fit to adorn the person apparently the hair is just an accessory to the face the hair has met with little consideration from the scientific world and few works have been written on the subject whilst the most trivial things have furnished materials for elaborate treatises and learned learned discussions it cannot, therefore, be deemed out of place that one of the most prominent characteristics of the human countenance should be investigated and popularized so as to render its, uh, so as to render its properties and purposes better understood by the many thousands to whom a fine head of hair is justly an object of solicitude. The growth of the hair is limited. In the female it grows longest, waving over the neck and shoulders, screening and protecting, as it were, from injuries which might be sustained by free exposure to air, light, etc. In the softer sex, those 1850s uh, viewpoints definitely apply to uh, binary considerations of sex and sex presentation. <clears throat> In the softer sex, the hair of the head usually reaches to the waist, and frequently, when suffered to grow much longer, and frequently, when suffered to grow, much longer. Sir Charles Bell mentions one woman who had hair six feet in length. So Tennyson speaks of the Lady Godiva, anon she shook her head and showered the rippled ringlets to her knee. No animal in creation experiences from his mane such inconvenience as man would do from the hair of his head. If obliged to walk on all fours, an evident proof that he was intended by his maker to maintain an erect position. The hair supplies a, short of, a sort of pad to the head by which it is protected from mechanical injury and guarded from the inclemencies of the weather. Although hair seems so smooth to the touch, yet the fact is confirmed by Bichot, Bichot? B-I-C-H-A-T, Bichot, Bichot? I'm not certain. Someone's name. And others that it actually possesses an Im, Im, uh, imbricated or bristled texture. The projections all pointing in one direction from the root to the tip, analogous to the feathered part of the quill, it was long supposed that upon this structure the operation of felting depended, in which hairs are mechanically entangled together and retained in this state by the inequalities on their surface, but careful investigation proves that this is not the case. The bulb from which hairs grow consists of three coverings or membranes superposed or placed in the same manner as the different coverings of the, of the opinion or any other bulbous oh sorry super imp sorry the bulb from which the hairs grow consists of three coverings or membranes superposed or placed in the same manner as the different coverings of the onion or any other bulbous plant the third or in innermost consisting the nucleus constituting the nucleus at the bottom of the bulb, the nucleus of which is a sort of bag, there is an opening connected with, a, with very minute vessels resembling roots. 
These convey nourishment from the blood vessels, which supply the necessary secretions to the hair. At the top of the bulb, about a dozen stumps grow together in a circular form and by their union constitute a round, hollow tube, which is the hair. The white knob at the lower extremity of the hair, and which is erroneously termed its root, is only the part inserted into the sac of the bulb. It is the first formation of the collective stumps growing together which constitute, when united, a single hair. The hair has strong electric prop... Yeah, that is what it says. The hair has strong electric properties. Witness the fact of stroking the hairs of a cat in the dark. Brushing and combing the hair have a soothing effect and frequently lull to sleep. The, the various uses and economical purposes of the hair are not clearly understood. There is little doubt, however, that like the, uh, like the pubescence and leaves of plants, the hairs perform some useful operations for the skin in absorption and ventilation. The leaves of plants and trees we know are mainly instrumental in absorbing the noxious carbonic acid ga gas of the atmosphere and after retaining the carbon, giving out the oxygen purified. Plants which are divested of their leaves are invariably weakened in their growth or destroyed. Or destroyed. If they have no leaves, they're weakened or destroyed. I suppose, technically, they could still live without leaves, as many deciduous plants do during the winter. But... So a deprivation of the human hair is usually found to weaken and enervate the frame. This article just said that if you lose your hair, you're going to get weaker. And the history of Samsoa, oh, no, Samson, and the history of Samson proves that strength lies in the luxurious, luxuriance, vigorous growth, and proper functions of the hair. They're pointing to what I believe is a Bible story of Samson. I don't know, actually. Uh, it, it is a definitely a folklore tale, possibly from the Bible, um, to, to, as proof that losing one's hair makes one, makes one weak. Okay, yes. Okay, from the Bible. Um, <laughs> Samson and Delilah. Thank you, Fluidan. I knew, I knew it was like Samson and Delilah. I just didn't know if it was a Bible story or not because I, like, I, I'm familiar with the general gen, generalities of the tale, but I'm familiar with it because of musical theater. Um, so, yeah. Uh, occasionally, however, it is found necessary to remove the hair from the head in cases of fever or disease to stay the inflammatory symptoms and to relieve the brain. The head should invariably be kept cool, close nightcaps are unhealthy, and smoking caps and coverings for the head within doors are likewise detrimental to the free growth of the hair, weakening it and causing it to fall off. Hats will make your hair fall out. 1855 take. Something that was published in this women's magazine in 1855 is a persistent wives' tale to this day. And I shouldn't say wives' tale, it's just... It is a colloquial term for um, a falsehood that is believed by many. In fact, hats do not make your hair fall out. Uh, people with balding heads wearing hats are correlated with balding heads. Like, hats are correlated with balding heads, but often because people with balding heads put hats on their heads. Uh, not that they lost their hair because they were wearing hats. Uh, Bible stories is literal anecdote, not data. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> You've never heard that hats make your hair fall out. Oh my gosh, it is definitely a, um, a uh, folklorish belief that hats make your hair fall out. And here we have, in 1855, an article in a women's magazine purporting to tell all about hair and how it functions that close caps will make your hair fall out. <clears throat> 
When screened from contact with the atmosphere, hair may be preserved uninjured for centuries, as it does not possess within itself the principle of decay, particular to all other animal substances, but would seem to be in a great measure incorruptible. This is also falsehood. Um, hair will indeed biodegrade and break down over time. Uh, in the case of like mummies and mummified bodies, where we find intact hair, um, that is because they were mummified and were pre preserved in a certain uh, environment that allowed for the retention of the flesh, though desiccated, and the hair. Um, in other bodies where decomposition is taking place and they are exhumed and the hair is found to still be intact, it's because the hair takes longer to break down than the soft flesh. Um, those hats are the ones that have the electric razors fixed in the cap. Uh, yeah, sure. It does not even rot or decay when exposed to air or immersed in water. Next to the bones, hair is evidently the most indestructible of the constituents of the body. Bones will actually decompose as well when exposed to the elements and time. Uh, fossilization occurs via a process of replacing the bone with rock and happens over a period of time under certain conditions and so the fossils that we find are actually stone they're not bone they are stone that retained the shape of the bone that they replaced they just happen to be of a different composition than the rest of the material around them because of the deposition of the, the stone in place of the bone over time so um yeah again bones are not destructible either and I am not a scientist. I have not studied in depth these things, but these are, these are things that I know from being interested in fossils and being, uh, I once considered archeology span as a possible life career path. Uh, and you know, what kid that saw Jurassic Park when they were in high school didn't think of archeology span as a possible career path. But I digress, let's, let's return to this. Um, there are accounts of its having been found in old tombs after all the soft parts have disappeared and has been detected on portions of the human skin which have been nailed to church doors for centuries. Again, desiccation and failure to decompose under certain conditions does not mean that it does not decompose at all. An interesting account of which is given by Mr. Quicket uh, of the in the Transactions of the Microscopic, Microscopical Society of London. A remarkable property of hair is the manner in which it is affected by the dampness of the atmosphere, which by relaxing its substance increases its length. Hence, hairs are often used for the construction of the best hydrometers. Hair can be stretched to one third of its ordinary length and will con contract again to its ordinary dimensions. The hair of different individuals differs considerably in thickness, ranging between 1 300th to 1 700th of an inch in diameter, and it is no less variable in its other physical properties, some kinds being much more dense and elastic than others, a circumstance which, as we have just seen, depends greatly upon the proportion of gelatin which it contains. Some measurements of the hair of the head have been made, by which it is ascertained that black hair is thicker than brown and brown than blonde. The average diameter of the hair of the head seems, however, to be 1 300th, 350th of an inch. From inquiries instituted into the number of hairs grown upon a square inch of the skin of the head, it appears that of black hairs there were 147, chestnut 162, and blonde 182. The chemical properties of hair are like those of horn, the nails, etc. Sulfurate of iron and a fluid secretion give the prevailing color. Black hair containing the largest proportion of iron, while, red, while in red or gray hairs, the sulfur is absent. 
With the varieties of the color of the skin, there generally coincide analogous differences in the hair and eyes. It is probable indeed that the coloring matter is the same in all, being combined in the cuticle with its peculiar cells and scales in the hair with a horny substance. The hair from its structure we have seen has not, inappropriately, been compared to the section of a plant. Every hair has a stem and a root, the latter being embedded in the skin as a tree is in the earth, but the comparison does not end there. The tree has bark, medulla, and intervening substance. The hair has the same. The bark, or cortex of the hair, displays a series of imbricated scales placed one overlapping another, just as we see tiles or slates overlap on a housetop. Indeed, actually, hair does have that sort of construction. Immediately below this scaly bark, we have a fibrous portion forming two-thirds of the bulk of the hair. These fibers are seen to separate when, the hair, when hair splits from being left too long uncut. The center of the hair has a little canal full, on, full of an oily lubricating substance containing the greater part of the coloring matter, which is blackish green in black hair, brown in brown hair, red in red hair, and is almost absent when the hair has become gray containing then phosphate of magnesia, which is not met with at other times. The hairs ordinarily appear round or cylindrical, but the microscope also discovers triangular and square ones, which diversity of figure arises from that of the pores to which the hairs always accommodate themselves. Their extremities split into two and three branches, especially when kept dry or suffered to grow too long, so that what appears only a single hair to the naked eye will be found a brush in the microscope. All short curly hair is mostly flattened, particularly the hair of the whiskers, beard, and mustaches. A transverse section of the hair will therefore show an elliptical form in some cases, from one side being grooved appearing in shape like a bean. The hair does not derive its support from the nutritious juices of the body, hence it will live throughout the body uh, uh, Hence it will live though the body be starved, and we thus find that the hair and beard grow for a considerable time after death. Indeed, actually, hair does not grow after death. Uh, what is observed as a lengthening, lengthening of the hair after death has to do with the uh, slow dehydration and deflation of the fleshy tissue of the body. Um, and as the flesh of the body sort of deflates, it appears that the hairs grow and that the nails grow because the flesh around them has subsided somewhat. The manner of the formation of the hair is identical with that of the production of the scarf skin on the surface of the sensitive skin. A fluid filtrated from the, from the blood is deposited on the surface of the vascular layers of the tube that is converted into granules, then into cells, and the cells, by a subsequent modification of their arrangement and form, become the bulb of the hair. The cells then undergo a little alteration from their original spherical form, which by a process of lengthening are finally converted into fibers, so that a hair in its section presents three different textures, a loose cellular structure in the center, a strong texture of parallel fibers, and a thin varnish-like layer of flattened cells consisting or constituting the polished surface. The hair differs almost as much in its texture as in its color. In chief varieties are observed the in the in chief varieties are observed in the copious, long, soft, and more or less curly hair of various colors. In the European, the strong, straight, and scanty hair of the South Sea Islanders, and the black, fine, wiry, crisp hair of black people. The very general characteristic of the darker colored people, I, nations is what it says here, and uh, okay, very general characteristic of people with darker skin is either an entire want of beard, what? Or a very scanty one developed later in life than in the white races. Okay. There is variation in beard density across all people. Yes, there are black people who have very patchy beards, but there are also white people with really very patchy beards. There are black people with very, very thick, luxuriant beards. And there are white people with very, very thick, luxuriant beards. 
There are Asian people with very, very thick, luxuriant beards, and there are Asian people with patchy, patchy beards. Because the way that the beard grows in, first off, is in sections. So if you want a full beard, you have to grow it for a long period of time because part of it will grow in while another part of it doesn't, and it can take more than a year for the full beard to fully fill in. Some people, it grows in very thick. Some people, it takes longer. Some people have very thin beards because we're all different and variation is the thing that happens. And, sorry, I, I have now gone off on beards. I could go into lots of detail on beards. I grew a beard once and it was very frustrating to me because it grew in in patches and I did a lot of research at the time to figure out what the heck was going on. So I know a little bit about beards and this is not accurate. Um, sorry. All shades of color of hair from coal black to light flaxen may be reduced to two classes, the black and the yellow. And in all varieties of mankind, the color of the hair corresponds with that of the skin, being black or dark colored with a dark complexion and red or yellow with a fair, with a fair skin. Except for when there's light hair on people with dark skin and dark hair on people with light skin, uh, both of which occur. Uh, there are peoples in Northern Africa that have dark skin and very light hair. There are peoples in basically all of Asia that have very light skin and very dark hair. Uh, so again, I say, this is not correct. I was not worth it. <laughs> um, When a white skin is seen in conjunction with black hair, as among the women of Syria and Barbary especially, the apparent exception arises from protection from the sun's rays. Uh, no. I mean, yes, exposure to sunlight does lighten hair over time. But women or men who are pale of skin and have black hair, and, and I shouldn't say women or men, it's just my brain with the magazine and the way that it, people with black hair and pale skin don't have black hair because they stayed out of the sunlight. And opposite characters are often found among people of one prevailing feature. Thus, red-headed Jewish people are not uncommon, though the nation in general have dark complexion and hair. In Europe, we find several well-marked varieties of complexion succeeding each other with gradations of latitude and climax from south to north, and the people of Europe may thus be grouped under the four latitudes of the Mediterranean, France, Germany, and Scandinavia. And, and non-scientific observation, non-scientific statistical observation would look and say, oh look, the olive-skinned people of the Mediterranean, or the olive-complexioned people of the Mediterranean, tend to have really dark hair. And as you move further north, hair color tends to get lighter, where you get browns and reds as you move up through Germany and France, and then you have blonde people in Scandinavia, and you would look at this geographical distribution and say there must be something to it. And indeed there probably is. And that thing is probably has to do with <clears throat> melanin in the skin with regard to the uh, amount of sunlight received at those latitudes and the long period of time that people lived there. Hence why people in equatorial regions tend to have darker skin and hair. Uh, and people in more polar regions tend to have lighter skin and hair. Although we know, uh, if we look at native peoples in Arctic regions, that they tend to have black hair, uh, owing to uh, genetic roots in Asia uh, that have been, anyway, I, I'm, I'm not, yeah, sorry. 1950s article about hair has really gotten me to go off and I'm sorry. Uh, the sad thing is that some of this nonsense was turning up in school books even when you were... Yes, yes, this was definitely still in school books in the 80s and 90s uh, because people believed it. 
In the first division, we have the Italians, Spaniards, Greeks, Moors, and Mediterranean Islanders. Among these, black hair and dark eyes with the complexion termed brunette are almost universal. Interesting, uh, in the 1850s, what we term today an olive complexion uh, was a brunette complexion. Interesting. I had not encountered that terminology before. In the latitudes of France, the prevalent color is a chestnut brown, to which the complexion and color of the eyes bear a relation. In the latitudes of Germany, in England, Denmark, and a great part of Russia, yellow hair and fair skin are prevalent. La okay, so they're saying blondes come before redheads, and that Scandinavia is redheads, I'm betting. Let's see. Uh, lastly, in the northern latitudes of Scandinavia, we find the Norwegians and Swedes, generally tall, with sandy hair and light gray eyes, so they're not accounting for red hair at all. In all climates, however, the inhabitants of mountainous districts approximate in character to those of northern latitudes? They're saying if you live on a mountain, your hair is lighter than if you don't, which I don't think even bears out statistically. I've never actually considered that, but for instance, the Swiss of the mountains above the plains of Lombardy have sandy or brown hair, while the Milani Milanese peasants have black hair and eyes with strongly marked Italian features. In the higher parts of Biscay, the fair complexion, light blue eyes and flaxen hair contrast with the black hair and dark complexion of the Castilians. Statistical observation is not science. And so while statistically these things might be true and you may see more fair-haired people up in the mountainous regions of the Swiss Alps, etc., there is, it, it, there will be reasons for that and we would need to, we would need to do a significant study to figure out why. Um, Probably going back to prehistoric times and looking at tribal movements of those times, because we know melanin in the skin and hair uh, is what ultimately affects the darkness and the, the coloration and, and things like that. And, and I'm sure it's probably called something different in hair, but melanin for the skin, etc. Um, and if we look at the genetics of that and the variation, it corresponds with sunlight exposure. Um, and so if we're looking and we're seeing people in a region where some of the people have different melanin concentrations than other people in the same region, there's gonna be a cultural reason why. Because scientifically we know that the melanin distribution, the color of the skin, um, whether it is pale, 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 pale white, like from the Northern Hebrides, uh, or really, really super dark uh, from like the equatorial regions of the world, it corresponds with sunlight exposure. So if there's an outlier, there's a cultural reason for it. Some group of people sometime in history migrated from a region where the sunlight exposure corresponded with the skin coloration and hair coloration that they exhibit into a region that does not correspond with that. And so we would need to look to cultural migration for the reasons for the discrepancy. Um. <laughs> Eumelanian, Eumelanian makes hair black or brown. Oh, so, sorry, eumelanin makes hair black or brown. Pheomelanin makes it red or blonde. Only redheads or those carrying the genes for red hair make pheomelanin. Auburn hair results from pheomelanin nearly hidden by eumelanin. And pheomelanin present in small amounts can make black hair shiny. Thank you, Hannah, for looking up the science of the actual melanin expression that causes different hair colors. The scientifically presented statistical observations written up in this women's magazine from 1855 
While they may have been accurate in their observation of the statistical distribution and geographical distribution of certain characteristics, um, fail to have the actual science that we now have that gives us real reasons for why certain expressions of characteristics happen. So thank you, Hannah, for looking up the actual science uh, that gave us that gives us that information. Wow, I didn't, I did not know that I was going to um, go so in depth on um, hair, <laughs> but uh, hopefully it was interesting. Not hair related, but language related. Uh, the Finnish language is not closely related to Swedish or, no, or Norwegian or Russian at all. Its closest relatives are Hungarian and Estonian. Yes, and I remember this coming up in um, in chat on, I think it was probably on Eric's stream. Um, and it's, it's very curious. It implies that the Finnish people probably migrated there from somewhere else and brought their language with them since it doesn't share linguistic roots with all of the other languages around it. So yes, you can look at the statistics of things and say, oh, uh, this doesn't match. And that is a clue. That should tell you, look for the cultural reason why it doesn't match. Because if we've tied certain characteristics or certain things to a specific geography, then if there's an outlier, it's most likely because there was human migration that caused a group of people to go from one place to another. And that is why they don't match all of the other people around them. So an example would be in America today, uh, there are, there is American English, and then there is, um, I forget, there's an actual term for it, but basically uh, standard black American English, um, and I, my brain will not give me what the actual term is for it, but there's a way of speaking that black people in America have that is different from other people in America, and actually holds much more consistently across uh, geographic regions of America um, because there is this more broadly shared cultural experience uh, in like hip hop culture and stuff like that, that that people in black America actually are exposed to and share as a culture uh, to connect with one another and uh, have people that understand the minor minoritized experience that they go through. Um, and so there's essentially an entirely different dialect of American English because a group of people was uprooted from their homes and brought here against their will and it developed into its own dialect and own characteristic culture over time despite being intermixed with the broader culture in the geography in which it was placed. <laughs> Sorry. I know a little bit about a lot of things, uh, but yeah. Here's a good subject to come through. Black American language makes so much sense. Yeah. Um, and, and so it is, it is a thing that's been written about academically. I don't know how much broadly it's discussed in, in the wider... Um, discussion, but it is definitely something that's been discussed. And it's it goes into, if you look at discussions of like code switching, um, where at home with family, certain cultural norms will apply for minority groups. But when you go out into public, you code switch into different cultural norms. And so black people at home with their family, have a certain set of cultural norms that are maintained. Asian Americans and Asian people in America have a certain set of cultural norms that they will maintain at home with family. Um, and you, you can look at this with uh, Latin people and uh, with 
uh, indigenous people and basically all of the minority groups, all of the, the um, disenfranchised groups within society, um, where there is a certain part of their culture that they have and this is who they are, but they step out into the world and code switch. It's like putting on a mask or putting on a different character, putting, putting on a character to go out into society and operate within the white supremacist world that is the broader society. Um, yeah. I, I do want to show, just before we end, because we are sadly at the end, um, we have, this is Ladies Godey's book from 1870, 1871, 1872-ish, and we start to get these pullouts um, where entire pages fold out uh, to like three times their width to show off the fashions. Um, and these are not just illustrations in black and white, but we even get color fashion pullouts like this. Godey's Fashions for February 1872. I mean, these are gorgeous books and the illustrations in them I think are the really, really interesting thing. Um, I honestly find Godey's Ladies Book more fascinating than I did the early Ladies Home Journal. I thought the early Ladies Home Journal was fascinating, like this early 20th century stuff. This women's magazine from the 1800s, from the 19th century, is just amazing. And this, this appears to be a wedding gown in the middle here. I just noticed that. You can see um, in 1855, they had the hoop dresses, uh, like the full-on circle hoop dress that made me comment that, um, that Kaylee from Firefly would like it. Here in 1871-72, we've got bustles. Uh, instead of the fully dome-shaped hoops, uh, now we've got bustles. Anyway, um, I'm going to ask, would you all want to see more of Godey's Ladies Book next week? I had, I had been planning, um, I, I, I had selected and was planning to do uh, the Blacksburg Community Federation or something, I forget exactly what it's called. But basically, um, a mutual aid agency that was operating from the late 1920s um, until the 1950s. So uh, it was part of the community chest movement during the 1930s. And I, I, I think it would be interesting to look at. But we can look at that in two weeks if you want to do more Godey's Ladies Book next week. We only really got through 1855 this week. Um, and there's more books with more very unique fashion illustrations. Uh, we can find some more stories. We can look for evidence of um, how the magazine was affected by the American Civil War. Uh, it was based out of Philadelphia. I imagine they probably had stories about the American Civil War. Um, and we didn't get to any of that today because we got too distracted with that article about hair, which incidentally was a, the first of a series of articles about hair. Um, I do not think we want to spend another hour um, pointing out all of the problems with their understanding of hair, but it was a women's magazine that chose to write an entire article on hair, which is definitely something that a women's magazine would do today. Um, so uh, we're definitely seeing like the roots of what a women's magazine was, fashion and hair and celebrity with that illustration of the, the, um, the celebrity woman, uh, fashion and hair and celebrity and um, making women hate themselves, all present in this women's magazine from the 1800s. So uh, yeah, I think we will do um, Ruth's hair, how dare. <laughs> I, I think we will continue with Godey's Ladies Book next week and plan on looking at the um, 
the Community Federation in two weeks so that we can talk a little bit about community aid organizations and uh, the, if you've ever played Monopoly, you've heard of a thing called community chest. Well, I have actual community chest letters in that collection um, that for me were rather fascinating because it was the first time I'd ever seen what actual community chest was outside of Monopoly. Uh, so let me look and see um, where we're going to go today. It's probably going to be the Monterey Bay Aquarium if they're live, but let me just double check. Um, I do want to say thank you everybody for coming by. Um, I think this was really fun today. Um, surprisingly fun today, actually. I, much more fun than Ladies Home Journal was. I'm just looking to, I always like to look and see if there's anybody who's got anything that's remotely relevant to what I've been talking about. So if there was anybody talking about like fashion or playing a game related to fashion or something like that, we, we would go over there because why not? But don't really see anything that would count. So what I think we're gonna do is we'll head over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, what are they doing today? It's the aviary cam today. So, you know, feathers. Feathers fits with what we looked at today, right? Um, we're gonna set up the raids on the two channels here. Um, but yeah, I thank you all for coming by. It is a lot of fun doing this. Um, uh, Monterey Aquarium. And I hope that I will see you again next week for more Goaties Ladies book. Um, and I hope that you enjoyed our journey into the past today uh, and that you will continue to come and uh, journey with me into the past in the future. Until then, bye.